and the frequency and timing is of, of these changes is what we would expect. Okay, that's very important. Uh, we have melting land ice and we have rising sea levels. That's usually all things that um, you have heard of. Maybe the less obvious is there's thinning sea ice, particularly in the Arctic. There's a lot of concern about that. And you all seen the uh, ice, uh, the polar bear uh, things. And you'll see a little bit more of that possibly. Uh, thawing permafrost, that's a potential very large problem. I'm not going to go too much into that. Uh, we have very strong evidence from length of season. Our growing season becomes longer. Our lakes are uh, freezing later. Uh, ice is melting earlier in the year. We have biologists who study species distributions that have uh, noticed migrations that are related to warming. And there's also um, of concern that diseases might spread in areas where they previously couldn't go into because it was too cold, for example. And there's more things. So, what are the greenhouse gases? Most of you notice the three most important ones are on top, the less important ones are uh, on the bottom. The dominant man-made driven greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide. For those of you who have been here earlier, you've seen already some details uh, on that. We produce carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide every time we combust something and every time we respire. Respiration is, a, is a, in, in the science is a term that's very broadly used, so it's not just human respiration, plants respire, so souls respire. And in terms of combustion, the use of fossil fuels is the major culprit, and I'll tell you why. So here's the commonly used bathtub analogy. Why is uh, CO2 in the atmosphere a problem? Well, if we take this bathtub as our atmosphere, the water in the bathtub as the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Yeah? Scientists have studied what's called the carbon cycle for a long time. There is a drain on the bathtub, and it's called photosynthesis. It picks up the CO2 from the atmosphere, puts it in plants and crops. It is the base of all life on it. What happens to that? Well, it gets stored, right? It, it produces what we know as the biosphere. And I tried to illustrate this by green and brown, meaning uh, plants and soils that we all rely on uh, for being here. And we are part of the biosphere, right? We all are made out of carbon. Uh, it's a major element in our body. The biosphere respires and thereby transfers that carbon back into the atmosphere and just goes round and around and around. A little wiggle here, a little wiggle there. Maybe some year there's a little bit more photosynthesis than respiration. Next year is a little bit more respiration photosynthesis. So you get a little noise in the system. Yeah? There's also a seasonal change, right? For the northern hemisphere during the summer, CO2 gets drawn out of the atmosphere, goes into the biosphere. During winter, it comes back out. Back out. Um, for those of you who have seen the movie about El Gore, he explains that as a breathing planet. So here's the culprit. Although we are only using a much smaller fossil fuel amount, then there is photosynthesis and respiration. I tried to illustrate that with the thickness of the arrow. What it essentially is, is we opened another faucet. Right? This faucet is going at, at this thickness, this drain is going at this thickness of the arrow. Yeah? There is no extra drain that would remove the extra input that we have here. So even though the drip, that faucet puts only a trickle extra in compared to the total turnover, there's no extra drain for this, right? So what happens over time? I'm going to start with a certain concentration, and as I keep putting a little bit of CO2 from the combustion fossil fuels in, the level of water in my bathtub rises slowly but consistently. <coughs> So let's have a look at the rise of CO2 in our atmosphere. This is a typical graph that you see when you go on the uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration website. Uh, very famous measure is here, also called the Keeling curve, because Dr. Keeling is the one who started it. And this are the original measurements started on the Mauna Loa Observatory, Hawaii, Northern Hemisphere. What you see here is the rough slope of this curve. Yeah? So if I draw a line here, I draw a line here, here, and then the line
last years, what you see is that there's been a slow increase. Yeah? The curve gets steeper and steeper over time. Now, could this be natural? Could this be some process that we're not aware of? A typical skeptic's argument. Yeah? Well, we scientists have addressed that a long time ago. Right? We looked into the past, what has been happening in the past, and we looked very carefully at the individual wiggles that are in this curve. Okay? So let's look at the past first. What you can see is that for, and I could draw this curve back for much longer. The point here is there's not been a dramatic change over thousands of years. Over the existing, of the, the existence of humans on Earth, there's not been a dramatic change until the Industrial Revolution, which is why we are very sure this is caused by fossil fuel combustion. Yeah? And this change here gets more and more dramatic the longer you spread out that axis on the bottom. Right? It's flat, 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 and then boom. Yeah? This has been controversial, and it has been uh, made known as the hockey stick. The graph that was called the hockey stick is a, is a different graph. It doesn't show exactly the data that's on here, but it looks very similar. Yeah? So keep in mind that this is somewhat related to the hockey stick. Yeah? That change, flat, and then boom. So looking into past, we, we know it has to do with us, and it has to do with uh, fossil fuel combustion, which started to take off with the Industrial Revolution. Now let's look at the most recent changes. Okay. If you were here this morning, you heard that we're currently at 390 parts per million in the atmosphere. Yeah? Just to remind you, this means there's one mole 390 molecules of CO2 in the atmosphere per one million molecules. Okay. It's a very tiny amount, but it does make a big change. What is this wiggle? Why is the red curve going up and down? A test here for the students in the audience. Seasonal. That's, those are the seasons, right? In the summer it goes down, here's your photosynthesis, in the winter it goes back up. Okay? <gasps> Obviously, there's this overall trend in it. That's what we analyze. We look at how does this trend change over time, and what can we tell about the cycling of CO2 through the atmosphere as a result of these processes that I showed with the bathtub. So this has been studied very much in detail. Well, we're obviously interested in the trend because that's what we're nervous about, right? So there is now a large group that's called, um, that works within what's called the GCP, the Global Carbon Project. And they put out graphs like this every year, okay? Uh, about 10 months ago, this graph was put out, which shows the development of carbon dioxide emissions, human cost carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. Yeah? And their forecast for 2010 was we're going to have this much in the atmosphere. Well, it turns out that we actually are much higher. Okay? So even though there was a little dip caused by the uh, global recession, we are now back on track, so to say. We're back on track and emitting very large amounts. Right now, 9 billion metric tons per year. Yeah? That's a lot. Who's going to put it out? You've been here this morning, you've seen uh, a similar graph. Uh, China is leading at this point, uh, second the United States, and then all the rest. Yeah? Know how much these two countries contribute to the system. Yeah? It's overwhelming. The shocking part, though, that I, uh, many Americans are not aware of is if you do this as on a per capita basis, you look for the black bars, mm. uh, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, Australia, and the United States are leading this. Yeah? So every, on average, Americans are very bad at putting a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. Okay? There's a reason for that, and I'll come back at the end of, uh, to that at the end of the talk. Okay? All right. This compares the actual emissions that have happened yeah? to what the, the National Panel of um, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put out over 10 years ago. Yeah? They are called the scenarios, the emission scenarios. Those are those colored lines. Okay? So on the bottom you see lines that correspond to if we have reacted, um, on 
retrospect now, right? That this progression was made in 1999, yeah? And so the international scientific community said, we got to do something about it. So if we do an aggressive schematic of reducing our carbon dioxide emissions, we may be going on a path around here. If we do business as usual, we're going to be on a path right here, yeah? So the next piece of uh, mm. bad news is we are on a business as usual trajectory, right? Right now, at least from a global perspective, nothing is happening, unfortunately. Okay, what does that mean? So we are on a business as usual trajectory, but so what? Well, from a scientific perspective, what we try to do is uh, we want to project into the future, we want to forecast what the climate will be as a result of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay. So we need to know what is going to be the development, and the curves you see here correspond to these scenarios. Yeah. So right now we're here at this white dot. Yeah. The blue scenario is the one where we would have aggressively addressed the problem, switching to essentially renewable, non-carbon emitting uh, energy uh, choices within um, 50 years or so. Yeah? So by 2050, we have completely gotten rid of all our fossil fuels. Yeah? So that looks good. Yeah? We're not actually completely gotten rid of. Obviously, there's still some 4 uh, billion tons of emissions. Yeah? But uh, drastic change and going back to close to zero um, within a few hundred years. Yeah? Um, whether that's realistic is a different question, right? It depends on many, many factors, uh, social factors for the most part, social political factors. Yeah? Yeah. So there's an error in here because how are we as scientists supposed to predict how politicians behave 50 years from now? Yeah? So a lot of the uncertainty is here, not in here because of the scientific uncertainty, it's more the social political uncertainty that goes into this projection. Uh, so right now we're on a curve that corresponds to maybe this orange or yellow. Yeah, uh, the red is not um, this uh, red orange part is not really that realistic. So even though it's the worst case, it's not that realistic because we now know, unlike 10 years ago, that there's probably not that much fossil fuel in the ground to actually burn. Mm. Yeah, so this would be really bad. But hopefully there's actually not that much there. Okay, what does that correspond to? It corresponds to a certain amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, at the end, right? When we burn all this much, or we made some changes and didn't burn as much, that corresponds to a certain amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and those are these amounts, yeah? Note that, uh, as you all wear the stickers, right? We would like to be at 350, but that is highly unrealistic. Okay, at least within the next few hundred years. Even if we stop everything right now, um, we wouldn't probably wouldn't get there within the next few hundred years. Okay, so that's the realistic viewpoint on this. It's uh, very laudable that we want to get there, and probably we have to get there, but not within the next few hundred years, unfortunately. That is due to the intrinsic short-term, uh, long turnover of carbon in our atmosphere in exchange with the biosphere. Well, we can stabilize it though at roughly 450, 550, or higher levels, depending on what we're going to do. Yeah? So, what uh, Dr. North is going to be talking a little bit more about is well, what does that correspond to in terms of temperature? And I'm just going to show you one graph from the last international uh, science community report, which shows again some of these scenarios as they translate into a prediction for the average change of global temperature, okay? So, even a, an aggressive scenario uh, stabilizes temperature roughly at two degrees Celsius higher than uh, it was at the beginning of the century, okay? Curiously, that was exactly what the politicians said they would want to limit this to, right? Note that um, in the last uh, international meeting in Copenhagen, when this agreement was passed, nothing said, nobody said anything about carbon dioxide, right? So it's a little disingenuous to say, well, we're not going to do much about carbon dioxide, when the prediction is you have to do a lot right now in order to 
actually achieve what you said you want to achieve. Okay? That's a very important point I'd like to get across. Okay? Alright, a uh, few words about consequences and then I'll stop. Um, what are we virtually certain about this degree of warming is going to bring about? Okay? Fewer cold nights and winters, not really that important for Texas, right? But other parts of the nation, this is quite important. Uh, more hot summers and warm nights, ooh, very important for Texas, right? Very likely, uh, two to three degrees temperature change, even under the aggressive scenario, yeah? So I'm, I'm only talking here about the aggressive scenario. This becomes virtually certain if we don't do uh, an aggressive scenario. Uh, more extreme weather events, we're gonna get more warm spells and heat waves uh, by the year 2050, um, when what we call now a century heat wave uh, becomes a twice a century. Wave. Yeah. So its likelihood is roughly going to double, and that goes further up. So on a business as usual, that uh, century heat wave it, it will be a decadal heat wave in 150 years from now, under the business as usual scenario. Yeah. Changing precipitation, that's also very important, uh, especially for Texas, but also other parts of the nation, because it may be even more or less. Okay? What many people don't realize is it's not just these points, right? It's not just it's going to be warmer. It's not just we're going to have a little bit more, a little bit less precipitation over the year. You're going to have secondary effects from that and reinforcement cycles, okay? You're going to have an effect that as a, what we call a feedback, will make it worse what happened in the first place, yeah? That's the best example is this summer, right? There was not enough rain, vegetation dried out vegetation didn't respire as much, and that also means it didn't put as much humidity back in the atmosphere, which made the atmosphere drier, which meant there was less rain, which meant the, you know, the vegetation got even less, and so on and so forth. Yeah? A drought is a typical feedback. It's a reinforcing cycle. Yeah? Once you don't have enough rain at the beginning of the drought, it's very likely you're not going to get enough rain later. And then you have secondary uh, and tertiary consequences from that, such as the wildfires. So, some of these examples, water issues, too little, too much, just talked about that. Yeah? Very likely, as the, uh, my colleague John Nielsen Gavin said, the drought's gonna end with a flood. Yeah? Once the drought's gonna be over, there's gonna be such heavy rain that we're gonna get flash floods in some areas. Changing biosphere, this is something that scientists in Texas are quite concerned about and have been doing research now for about 10 years or so. Um, on the plateau, you get what's called woody encroachment. Your whole system is changing from a prairie to a kind of a shrubland. Um, the shrubs can deal much better with uh, less moisture in the soil. Crop changes, crop losses. In 50 years from now, you will not uh, have corn um, or cotton anymore in the state because the climate is not going to be conducive anymore of growing these. In the worst case, you may get decertification. That's a big problem in Africa. Uh, species extinctions, this is what a lot of biologists are concerned about. Just to give you one example, it is expected that corals globally will go extinct sometime between 2050 and 2100. There'll be no more uh, snorkeling in beautiful uh, coral areas of the world in 50 to 100 years or so. Okay, what can be done? This is my last slide. I say, the, although I've, I've not put this list together myself, I just read this in a, new, uh, in a report that came out last week. And I thought, well, gee, these are all, except for the fourth one, these are all no-brainers. We all know this, there's no new technology we have to invent for them. We could do all of this right away. Yeah? For the fourth one, obviously, what you'd be doing is you, there's a trade-off between two risks, right? And that's obviously why there's a lot of political discussion. But for the other three, no brainers, basically. Yeah? We can all do this, and we just need to have the will to do it, and we should do it as early as possible. Okay, thank you for your attention.